sweeties who will fill your life with joy. Some girls will break your heart, leave you crying on the street, destroyed. Don't need an overachiever. River City Girls knows exactly what it wants to be from the moment we boot it up. A spin-off adventure starring the love interests of the lead characters from the Kunio-kun franchise, ignoring previously established continuity in favor of a fresh new start. Sure, there are numerous references scattered all throughout, but make no mistake, from the American-Japanese fusion of aesthetics to the Saturday morning cartoon-like humor, though it shares the name River City, Girls is its own thing entirely. And though the first game does a wonderful job of balancing its dramatic elements with the comedic tone, its sequel has a tendency to overindulge in its humor. This is best illustrated by the constant fourth wall breaking. They probably have better odds just waiting for us at the top rather than attacking us in here in waves. Yeah, probably, but no gonna happen. You know, mentioning the absurdity of fighting in elevators and how often beat-em-ups have us fighting in elevators doesn't change the fact that we're still fighting in elevators. This is just one example, but this happens so often in River City Girls 2 that it really took me out of it all. Which is a shame because in so many ways the narrative structure and tone of River City Girls 1 was riveting, rambunctious, and it radiated with a rhythm so rare it really resonated with me. By no means is River City Girls 2 a bad game, quite the contrary, from a gameplay standpoint it far surpasses its predecessor, but when it comes to the story and tone, 2 could take some notes from what came before. Janiac. See that? That's my theme song. And like most theme songs, it sets the tone for what's to come. So what genre do you pick to match the erratic, hot-blooded action of River City Girls 1? Why, punk rock, of course. The lyrics give all the exposition needed to enjoy this beat-em-up. There's these two girls, their boyfriends have been kidnapped, now they're gonna save them. An awesome and refreshing role reversal without ever getting preachy about it. Our protagonists, Kyoko and Misako, love their respective boyfriends, Riki and Kunio, almost to the point of unhealthy obsession. Whenever the girls talk about Riki and Kunio, their descriptions of them are actually pretty vague, and at times, superficial. They're quick to jump to the boys' defense whenever someone speaks negatively about them, but the only time we, the audience, are presented an idea of what their relationship is like is in the opening cinematic. This is genius, once you consider the game's ending. But we'll get to that later. It should be noted that the snarky tomboy Misako is paired with the hot-blooded hero Kunio, while the playful and kind-hearted Kyoko is paired with the more reserved and stoic Riki. These are the characters as they're portrayed in River City Girls continuity, and I will be analyzing them on their own merit. Misako is a pretty straightforward character. She revels in violence, cuts with her words, and has an aversion to all things feminine. Well, not all. She wears lipstick and the color pink, so yeah. Her fighting style consists of wrestling moves with much more aggressive and to-the-point techniques compared to Kyoko, whose moves are a lot more flashy and over-the-top. Kyoko, in my opinion, is a much more interesting character. On the surface, she's just an airheaded girly girl that's nice to everyone she meets, but all of that changes once you remember that she's considered just as much of a delinquent as Misako. She was expelled for stealing basketball hoops in fifth grade, and as these scenes suggest... And I'm teaching my school to hang out here. I humiliated you by expelling you from your school. <laughs> Seriously? I don't even go to that school. Here lies Misako, killed by numbers. 
I don't even go to this school. She skips school frequently enough for others to think that she's part of another one. She may not prioritize fighting, but she's been in enough fights to have grown accustomed to them. Honestly, it's a unique take on the ditzy stereotype we're so used to seeing. And having these two banter with each other provides the right amount of levity needed as the player progresses through the game. The characters are funny, but they take their goals very seriously. The girls get a message saying their boyfriends have been kidnapped. To find them, they follow clues given by NPCs, usually voiced by YouTubers. Put me in River City Girls 3. Along the way, they fight a giant bully in the school, a psychic stalker on the rooftop, a famous clothing designer in a factory, a double dragon reference in a train station, a rock star during her concert, ultimately concluding with the daughter of a gang leader in a prestigious building. Altogether, this may sound random, but what keeps this narrative from being nothing more than a bunch of action set pieces is how it's structured. Escalation is the basic storytelling device used for this game. We start in a school, a small place commonly associated with youth, liveliness, and innocence, and we conclude in the San Wakai Tower, where criminals are free to indulge in whatever immoral activity they please. These delinquent girls end up in criminal territory, all in the name of love. To make things even funnier, right before they fight Sabuko, the daughter of crime lord Sabu, once the girls realize their boyfriends aren't there, they're prepared to go somewhere else to keep looking. This is after basically wiping out an entire gang, mind you. They were ready to just keep going, I love that. But the reason they even got this far is because each boss would tell them where they last saw Riki and Kunio. Because every account given for their boyfriend's location is completely different, it leans quite well into what's being foreshadowed. From the very first level of the game, Hasabe and Mami keep reappearing to insult our heroines along their quest, with some very interesting dialogue. Have you two seen Kunio or Riki? Just like, every day. Every night, actually. They've been kidnapped! I got a text! That must be so special for you. We don't got time for this! Step aside, we need to find our boyfriends. Your boyfriends? <laughs> Could they be any more clueless? What's so funny? Kunio loves me. Riki is mine. Do you honestly think they'd give a pair of rejects like you two the time of day? Why does it matter what time it is? I don't believe it. Kunio, he, he likes me. Sure he does. And Ricky is totes my BF. Go ahead and ask him. Oh, we will. Tonight. <laughs> <laughs> And when this is paired with dialogue from other characters... But when I got to the park, Kunio was already there. And so was Hasabe. Oh dang, that's hecka sad! Or Kunio, maybe. That trash girl never deserved him. Have you seen Kunio and Ricky around here? Nope. Why, they ditched you guys again? Again? No, they got kidnapped. What about the boys in this photo? Mm. Sorry, but I ain't seen them. But you kidnap, like, everyone. So then maybe they weren't kidnapped. But then, where are they? Who knows? It becomes quite clear what's going on. You see, after besting Sabuko, the girls fall out of the tower, and this happens. Oh, man, you were right, Ricky. A trip to the spa's just what we needed. I agree, Kunio. It is relaxing. Huh? Ah, it's girls! Look away! The spa's for men only. Kunio! You big dummy, we've been looking all over for you! <laughs> we thought you were kidnapped, Ricky Poo! Ah, oh, jeez. It's those crazy girls again. What were their names? No idea. Come on, let's get out of here. Yeah, maybe Hasabe and Mommy are still up. <laughs> Now, I'm aware that this is a controversial take, but I'm gonna say it. I love this ending. Discovering that we were in fact playing as the delusional jealous girls is quite interesting. Though their intentions were good, what they were doing was never heroic, but rather selfish. It explains why their descriptions of their boyfriends are so surface level, and it changes how we view earlier scenes in the game, especially with Hasabe and Mami. This is made all the more entertaining once we fight them as the secret boss. Face it, rejects. We're the ones Kunio and Ricky love. 
Yeah, admit it. Are you crazy? They barely remember you. Yeah, you guys dated them for like one 16-bit game. It wasn't even released in the USA. Talk about obscure. You want to fight again? Fine, you're their girlfriends. Whatever. It's worth noting that originally the ending remained the same regardless of which boss you fought, but after fans complained, we got a new ending. Kunio! You big dummy, we've been looking all over for you! <laughs> we thought you were kidnapped, Ricky Poo! Kidnapped? As if! What made them think that? No idea. Come on, let's get out of here. I'm starving! Let's get a Merv burger. You girls want to join us? The problem with this new ending is it completely ruins all the foreshadowing. Now it's just characters giving false information. Though, to be fair, there were already inconsistencies with the original ending. Stay down. I'll make us fight you again. Got a real mouth on you. Must be why Kunio likes you. Exactly! I came here to train myself and get tough like my hero, Ricky. My Ricky? The very same! And hey, if Ricky and Kunio were never in danger, then who sent the message saying that they were at the beginning? Did I miss something there? Anyway, it was a dark ending with a dark twist, and the gradual progression from a funny and lighthearted tone to a dark and twisted tone was reflected perfectly in the soundtrack. Had they stuck to their guns, it would have been interesting to see a follow-up to this. What happens once the delusion has been proven false? These two girls who've been primarily defined by their relationship would have to actually create their own character, their own goals, their own adventures. It would have been cool. These punk rock delinquents going on dark and twisted adventures with a lighthearted backdrop and aesthetic. It would have created this perfect blend of tones and given the series a very unique identity. But fans didn't like the twist, so it was changed. And so too was the tone for the sequel. Okay, wait, before we get to 2, a prequel was released titled River City Girls Zero. Truthfully, this is a localization of Japan's 1994 game, bear with me, Shin Nekatsu Koha, Kuniotachi no Banka. I'm sorry. This story has a much more serious tone than River City Girls, and heck, even other games in the Kunio-kun franchise, but it stars Kunio, Riki, Misako, and Kyoko, so it kinda made sense to adapt it. So how do you integrate such a grim adventure into our newly established humorous tone? Uh, you don't. Interestingly, this game offers two English translations, one that directly translates what the original Japanese game intended, and another that westernizes the script to fall more in line with River City Girls. One likely reason for this is because, well, the original game hasn't aged well in terms of modern western values. Kunio and Riki spare no insults towards their supposed girlfriends, which kinda makes sense. Remember, Kunio and Riki are delinquent. They're not exactly model citizens, but it's easy to see why that may not sit well with modern audiences, so changes had to be made. The strangest of which is the framing device. So this quote-unquote prequel to River City Girls is framed as a game being played by Misako and Kyoko. They flip-flop between the game actually being their past and it just being a game. So, like, which is it? If it's just a game, then why do they mention a desire to dress the way they used to? If it's really their past, then why don't they remember being shot? Well, it doesn't matter, it's all a joke. Everything is in service of a joke. Any comment that they make about the possible continuity is just a joke, meant to be laughed at and ignored. We get the references and we appreciate them, but come on, does everything have to be a joke? Admittedly, it's a neat way to introduce new audiences to characters like Ken, but this only gets undermined once we're reintroduced to him in River City Girls 2. Remember how I said a theme song sets the tone for what's to come? Well, here's the theme song to River City Girls 2.
We get a new rock song, but now the lyrics are a lot more comedic. Now it's making a direct reference to the final boss being a final boss. There's new threats in the city and our heroes are tasked with getting rid of them. Once again, we're given a simple plot, but now it's a bit more vague. It's great that we aren't retreading the same story beats as last time, and honestly, the idea of a sequel was rather enticing. The girls could now be defined by more than just their relationships, they could have personal stakes this time around, and maybe fight bosses that actually have it out for them. Fortunately, this game checks all those boxes, and even goes a step further by having most of the bosses work for the same person this time. But when it comes to who the bosses actually are, it was hard to get excited compared to last time. We have Suiko, a social media influencer who can warp reality into her profile page, full of references to numerous beat-em-ups. We have Primo, a celebrity chef who uses food to mind control students at River City High, whose boss fight contains confession cam style commentaries between phases. And we have a witch named Blair. Get it? These three were hired by Sabu's adopted son, Ken, who's also a boss. Sabu adopted him in River City Girls Zero because he looked like Kunio. That way, they could frame Kunio at the beginning of the game. In Zero, Ken is a dangerous threat, with an unwavering cold-hearted attitude, whose fighting skills are on par with Kunio and Riki. But here, he's portrayed as a spoiled brat that would rather have others do the fighting for him. Honestly, I don't hate this interpretation, but I can't help but wonder if this change was only made to be yet another joke. Like, seriously, in River City Girls Zero, when a gun is used by anyone, it's no laughing matter. So it was surprising to see Ken using a gun here, but when he uses it, it's not taken very seriously. You two aren't half bad. Oh. Well, yeah, I mean, we told you. Maybe he's got wax in his ears. Does look a little grimy. Allow me to put a bullet between yours! Between our what? Eyes, maybe? Ears! Between your ears? You just said ears, so that's why I'm gonna shoot you now! Maybe he does got wax in his ears. A bullet between the ears? That's not a saying. Apparently, Ken brought these three bosses together after Sabuko messed up at the end of the previous game. Yeah, this game picks up right where River City Girls 1 left off, but instead of following Misako and Kyoko, we follow Sabuko, which is pretty cool. After bringing shame to her family, her father Sabu decides to take matters into his own hands. After that, Kyoko and Misako are kicked out of school by Ken, and... Well, at least we finished the school stage quicker this time. What do you mean? Nothing. Attempt at meta humor. Expect a lot of attempts throughout this game. You know, in the original game, I could only think of two moments that the characters would break the fourth wall, but here, it's everywhere. Anyway, the girls go to Kyoko's house to play video games for two months, causing them to lose their XP and forget their super moves from the previous game. They know the Yakuza have taken over their school, but that's not what gets them off the couch. Kyoko's mother tells them a sequel to one of their favorite video games is available at the mall, and boom, the game starts. You know, the first game didn't really go into the girls' hobbies, a lot of that was implied by their fighting moves. Misako clearly likes wrestling, and Kyoko seems to enjoy sports. But I would have never guessed that the girls were gamers. Sure, in River City Girls Zero, they play the game we're playing, but that was just a framing device. Kyoko doesn't even seem to know much about video games during the cutscene, so, uh, were they made gamers to appeal to the people playing as them? Anyway, the girls go after their video game and learn about the Yakuza taking over the city, so they decide to stop the Yakuza all over the place. Now, this sounds like a good setup for a high-stakes battle, we're saving the city for crying out loud, but as I mentioned before, most of the bosses are just played for laughs. Heck, some of them don't even seem interested in what's going on at all. Aside from the four bosses I mentioned earlier, we also have Provi, a returning character from River City Underground. We can play as her after defeating her. I love her new design, good to see her again. 
Also returning is Marion. Yeah, Double Dragon's Marion. Like Provi, she becomes playable once we defeat her. Gotta say, whoever wrote Marion being in a thruple with Billy and Jimmy is a genius. It's funny and it explains a few things. And then we fight Ken again, this time with the Ryu brothers, ultimately concluding with a fight against Sabu, this time in the basement of Sanwakai Tower. Sabu, the criminal overlord. Sabu, arguably Kunio's biggest villain. And how do the girls react to him? Who's the glowing dude? And why is he like super ripped? I think it's Sabu, but like jacked up on coffee or magic or something. Your words have no effect on me. With the serum in my veins, my strength has been magnified to such a magnitude that you think it's the dark arts? Like that creepy Amada kid? Hey, yeah, maybe. Unless it's just some old person thing. He is pretty old. Old people glow with magic? Excuse me. I'm trying to tell you about my master plan. It's very impressive. If you just listen for two minutes. I bet it's special effects, like in the movies. Oh, yeah, I saw a movie once. All kinds of stuff glowed in it. What is this, the MCU? To top it all off, here's how the game ends. Ooh, get him! Punch that vampire! BP2 is so much better than the first game. Doorbell. I'll get it. Huh? What are you two doing here? Did you really think we'd miss this adventure? Yeah, get up, losers. It's time for a rematch. But we already finished. Yeah, Sabu's beaten up, his empire's in ruins. The end. You idiot! I told you we should have come straight here! It was your idea to stop for smoothies on the way, Hasabe! You know I get low blood sugar, Mommy! Huh. Looks like we beat the game. So what now? You wanna play through again? <laughs> You're on! I like River City Girls. I really do. I like the freeform and creative combat, the innovation of jump cancelling. I love the attention to detail, like how Kyoko holds her skirt down when she's falling, or how every character has a unique phone and wallet when entering stores. I like everything about River City Girls, except the tone of its story. Having jokes is fine, as long as it's not at the expense of its narrative. Because if none of the characters are taking the game seriously, or care about what's going on, then why should we? Honestly, River City Girls 3 could pick up from the Hasabe and Mami ending. They clearly remember events from other games in the franchise, so maybe that knowledge, knowing that they should be the main characters, plagues them and sets them on a path of revenge. We could even start the third game playing as them, crafting a team of fighters from other games to destroy all of River City, one district at a time. Have Kyoko and Misako actually lose some districts, forcing Misako to enlist the help of bosses from previous games. Maybe this causes tension between the two and their friendship is put to the test. It'd be so cool, but we probably won't get that. Who knows? All I know for sure is that you should totally be following me on my social medias, but especially Twitch if you want to see me live stream. I already played this game with my best friend, but hey, if they make another River City, we'll definitely play that one too. If you enjoy hearing my voice, be sure to check out the Junior and Marcus Talk podcast, where me and my best friend talk about just about anything. If you want to talk to other fans of the things we talk about on this channel, be sure to follow the Discord. I also have a backup channel in case anything happens to this one. And finally, be sure to check out the merchandise. The link to everything I just listed will be in the description down below. So, what did you think of River City Girls 1, 0, and 2? Let me know in the comments, and I'll be sure to check out what you have to say. Until then, I'll leave you with this.